Wow, beautiful. I want to be a student again. Maybe then I could sing. Won't sing tonight. Well, I see some colors, to be honest. It's a beautiful pink shirt. Anyway, Margarita asked me that as I start tonight, I should do an interview with myself because she couldn't ask me one question. I think she's trying to ask every speaker. The question is, if I could ask one thing from God, what would I ask him? Is that correct? It's very simple. My question would be, what kind of coffee would we drink in heaven? <laughs> if I could know that, I could encourage a lot of my friends to join me. <laughs> well, uh, life is definitely uh, easier when you drink coffee or whatever you enjoy, but uh, sometimes, let me begin by saying this, sometimes life can get confusing. And sometimes ministry can get confusing. And there is a vivid image in my mind of a person who got really confused. And to share the story with you, I have to take you back to my elementary school, which is Bochkoi Istvan Elementary School in the 11th district of Budapest. Okay? I had pretty cool classmates, and one of them was especially cool because his name was Lajos. Now, most Hungarians know that nobody these days names their sons Lajos, so he was a special guy. He was into wrestling, so he really didn't care much, what should I do with this? He didn't care much about team sports, or uh, he didn't care much about sports that involved any kind of ball, okay? It's important to know. So one afternoon, uh, Lajos and our friends went down to the gym in our elementary school and we played basketball. Now for most people, <clears throat> basketball is an easy game. Two teams, two baskets, one ball, one ball, one ball, one ball, and the purpose is to get the ball into the basket of the other team. <laughs> most people know that. Well, not Lajos. Ten minutes into the game, and ten minutes, friends, even if you know nothing about basketball, in ten minutes, just by watching it, you can figure it out what the purpose is. Well, most people can, not Lajos. Well, ten minutes into the game, Lajos got the ball, and he went for it. He chose the closest basket. And you can guess, it was the wrong one. <laughs> but, and we watched him. He started, shoot, started to shoot, tried to get the ball into the basket. <clears throat> and to be honest, at first, we got frozen. I mean, Lajos, what are you doing? <laughs> You're killing the game. You're making our team lose. But then, you know what? We really started to enjoy it. <laughs> we turned around, and we let him. We let him have it, and we made one step further. We started to root for him. Lajos, go! You can do it! Now, Lajos got really excited. First, nobody was attacking him. Second, everybody was rooting for him. So with more passion, more zeal, he tried to get the ball in. And finally, he succeeded. Everybody was screaming like crazy. <clears throat> we hugged him, we celebrated him, and then we told him what he did. <laughs> and that was the moment when I saw confusion. Confusion was all over Lajos's face. Now you might say that was wrong morally. I think it was, but we enjoyed it. But Lajos was a cool guy. And uh, he laughed as hard as we did once he calmed down <clears throat> from the excitement of the game. <clears throat> now, quite often we get confused uh, as Lajos gets confused, got confused on his uh, basketball field. We sometimes lose direction. We sometimes forget the purpose. We sometimes don't know what's going on. And others around us might act 
in a confusing way. So my role, I think, tonight is, um, with the other speakers, with Teruko this morning and the others coming up, is to help you with some clarity when it comes to discipleship, because discipleship can get confusing sometimes. So uh, my role is to, uh, the way I will try to help you is to make some connections tonight. That's all I want to do. Make some connections. Make one, especially one, very easy connection. All I will try to do tonight, because it's late, it's very simple, is connect being with doing. That's all I want to do. Connect with, connect who you are with what you do. Okay? Very simple. Just like basketball. Very simple. Um, sad reality in Christianity, I think, is that these two quite often get separated from each other. And you must keep these two connected. It's fairly simple. Let me give you a very simple truth of life. Who you are on the inside must show on the outside. Who you are on the inside must show on the outside. I'm too far away from you. I'll move closer. Yo, that helps. Connection, right? Must happen. So, if you have love in your heart for someone, like Tariku has love in his heart for his wife, just like I do, you do sacrif sacrificial things for that person, right? If you have a wounded heart, you will have wounded words and you will wound others. The two cannot be separated. Who you are on the inside will show on the outside. And I can also say it this way. There is an invisible Lhotse Bacinski in front of you. There's a part of me you don't see. And there's a visible Lhotse Bacinski in front of you, the one you can't see. And God expressed in his word that for him, both are very important. Uh, there is a conversation in John 14 between Philip and Jesus. And uh, God, as you know, is invisible. He expressed himself beautifully, perfectly in the visible Jesus. So here comes Philip. He says, we don't see the Father. He's invisible. We don't see him. Jesus, we see you. Show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. What did Jesus answer? He said, Philip, I have been with you guys for so long. If you see me, you see the Father. Whoever sees me sees the Father because we are one. It's a beautiful image. The external was a perfect representation of the internal. The visible was in perfect harmony with the invisible. Now what happens when these two get separated? Okay, it causes problems. If these two start to go on different ways, they depart, what happens? Problems. What is the number one problem of the separation in the New Testament? They are called the Pharisees, right? There was something on the outside. They were Christians on the outside. Let's put it simply this way. But on the inside, something very different, selfish and prideful. There was a disconnect between the two, and Jesus did not like it because it should be connected. Another one. You believe something on the inside, but you are too afraid to show it on the outside. Do you feel that in evangelism? Do you sometimes feel like that in your Christian walk? You believe something, but wow, make that faith step in the visible realm. Ooh, that is too much. That is too much. Or you say you believe something, but you don't do it. James talk about it. Unless we see it, how do we know it's there? Unless you act upon what you believe, how do we know you really believe? Thomas Fuller took it one step further. He said the following, 
he does not believe who does not live according to his belief. Wow, that's pretty heavy. He does not believe who does not live according to his belief. If you don't do it, it's quite a good question to ask. Do I really believe it? If I don't do it, do I really believe it? Uh, have you guys seen the movie, The Highlander? There's one line everybody knows from that movie. What is it? I, I won't sing it. Maybe the Georgian choir could sing it. There can be only one. It's a perfect line. I love it. He talks about something completely different, but I'm borrowing the line for tonight. There can be only one you. There cannot be two yous. That's integrity. That's oneness. That is what I'm trying to talk about tonight. It means oneness. And uh, I'm going to try to be very simple tonight. Once it's past 8 o'clock, uh, life becomes very simple for me because my brain goes into the simple function um, from the uh, less simple function during the day. So I'm going to give you four little things, four connections. How do we connect in discipleship the being with the doing? Okay, that's all we'll do. And then we'll go out and drink some Illy coffee if you find any. Okay, uh, the passage that I'm going to use besides other passages, but first, is from Matthew. Matthew 12, 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers. Now, this is not the line that I'm going to use, but I have to read it. It's in there. You brood of vipers. You can speak uh, good. How can you speak good when you are evil? Now, the following line I'm going to use. Listen to this. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. The evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. Let me read it again. From out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. God connects the two. What's inside should come out. All right, I think you get the picture. It's a vital connection. Now, how does this whole thing relate to discipleship? That's our question on this weekend. How does this all relate to discipleship? Tariku mentioned this m m sentence in the morning, so I'm going to use it again. In order to make disciples, you have to be a disciple. So simple, just like basketball. Sometimes it get con gets confusing. In order to make disciples, you have to, you must be a disciple. <clears throat> you cannot separate the two in discipleship either. If you are a disciple, you say you're a disciple, but you're not discipling anyone. Mm -mm. It's not biblical. It should flow out of it. It's naturally connected. If you try to make disciples, Without you being a disciple, mm -mm, won't work. The two must be connected. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who is one of my favorite theologians, he died in the Second World War. He was a German priest who stood up against Hitler. So he said the following, Christianity without discipleship is Christianity without Christ. Wow. Christianity without discipleship is Christianity without Christ. That's why I love him. He always challenges me. He always challenges me. Now, four passages, four connections, as I promised. Uh, since we are at a Campus Crusade retreat, the very first Bible verse I need to use is 2 Timothy 2.2. Otherwise, I would lose my job tomorrow, right? <laughs> and come on. I have three children waiting for me back home. So I'm going to use 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, no matter what. Man, I love this passage. You know why I love this one line? 
There's so much in it. I heard it multiple times. We heard it last night. And there is still much more to it. So let's just take one more little thing out of this verse that we have heard so often. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach uh, others also. Okay, so you saw last night the second part of this verse. What you have heard, just pass it on to others and, and enjoy what happens, okay? When I teach it in a training, in an LLTC training, I draw that diagram all the time and I love it. I could name the names that I saw in my little chain. But there is something at the beginning of this verse that I talk less about. What it is? What you have heard from me. What you have heard from me. We mention this less. Why? Why is this important? Why is this important? You know what this means? To me, this is what it means. You have nothing to teach in you. You have nothing to give on your own. You have nothing to offer on your own. You must receive first. You must receive first. If you try to do this little diagram thingy without the first part, you are separating the being from the doing. You must receive first. You must receive first. The best Bible studies I ever led with students or in our church always had two characteristics. One was, you can guess, Ely coffee. The other one, I'm addicted, but who cares? <laughs> Pray for me. I'm just preparing my soul for an eternity of drinking Ely coffee because my guess is God would answer, Lotsi, welcome. Welcome home. Here's your Ely coffee. <laughs> well, maybe not. Actually, this has nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight, but it's too late and I'm simple. I read a book on heaven, and there is, it's multiple questions that you and I always ask about heaven. And there's one section where the question comes up, will there be coffee in heaven? So I'm serious about this thing. I read about it. So ask me later what the answer is, okay? So that you will walk with me. Anyway, the best Bible studies I ever led. Coffee? Yes. Thank you. Let's see. Thank you. Okay. The other part, when I shared something with the guys that first went through my heart. If it was only a material that was handed to me and we filled it out, you know what? It was boring. Even with Illy Coffee, it was boring. But when that material first was received, first went through my heart, man, made a difference. Because then I had something to offer that was not in me. Crucial. First connection is this. Let me read it to you. Connection number one. In order to give, very simple. In order to give, you must receive first. It is that simple, just like basketball. But quite often, I played discipleship like a loyosh. Now you know what I mean. Second, let me continue on this thought as we enter the second connection, the second one. As I talk to students, I pretty much we talk about what are the obstacles for you as a student to make disciples. You can name your things, but one thing comes up quite often. A lot of students uh, feel like, at least in Hungary, but I'm guessing in your country too, is that most students say, I don't know if I can make disciples because I don't know if I have enough. I don't know if I know enough. I don't know if I have wisdom. I don't know if I have knowledge. I don't know if I have experience. I mean, I'm just one year older. What can I give? I understand the staff who have been with God for 30 years 
have a lot to offer, right? So why don't you just find a staff and then they'll take care of you? As I thought about it, I think the real problem behind this fear is when we think that in order for discipleship to happen, there must be something in me that I can offer. That is why we fear. Because we feel like I'm building on the first connection, right? There, is some, there must be something in me as a student who is just 21 years old. There must be something that I can offer. Well, let me read you the second passage, or the third passage, but the second passage when it comes to connections. Luke 14, 33. So therefore, any one of you students from Eastern Europe, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. This is what Jesus says. Any one of you who does not renounce all all that you have cannot be my disciple. What does that mean? What does that mean? I believe first you must empty yourself of yourself in order so you can give. Why is that? I think you must empty yourself of yourself in order to receive. And once you received, just turn around and start sharing it. <clears throat> How does this work? Um, let me ask you one thing. Uh, as you look back on your Christian life, did you change yourself or has God changed you? Did you change yourself or has God changed you? Unless you're convinced only God can change the heart, you have some learning to do. And this is why. You and I, we were in complete depravity. We were completely lost. He came... He chose, he gave faith through grace alone, in Christ alone. Anything you have spiritually is from him. Anything you have spiritually is from him. And we are so focused on the performance, on the performance of discipleship, but this is what I need to tell you tonight. Don't try to perform discipleship. Let discipleship happen to you first. And this is what discipleship to me means. Being a di disciple means emptying yourself so that you can receive and then you can pass on. This is connection number two. To disciple others does not take long years to learn. Believe me. To disciple others does not take long years to learn. What it takes is a faith step to die to self. Once that happens, you will receive, and then you can give. And that sounds simple, but this morning you heard Tariku talk about that faith step, to die to self. And quite often when I hear uh, a message, I go, I really enjoyed that talk. Now, this is the kind of talk that just doesn't allow me to say, I really enjoyed it. Because if I respond to what Tariku asked me this morning, it might not be joyful. You know that neck thing? Wow. Wow, but that's where it starts. That little faith step to die to self. That makes you ready to receive, and then you can give. All right, third connection. You must be like him so that you can disciple others. Luke 6:40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. A disciple is not above his teacher, but when anybody is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Now, a story. Have you guys seen, it's an old movie, The Karate Kid. Have you seen it? Everybody? Okay. I don't see you in the back, so... I'll give you the short Baczynski Lotsi version, even with certain karate moves. So prepare yourselves. <laughs> okay, there is this teenager who wants to improve his skills in karate. Okay, so he finds this old man who uh, starts to train him. The first training is what? You remember? There's a beautiful car. A beautiful car. All he needs to do is just exactly, there is the move. 
He needs to do this, waxing the car. He needs to make it shine, but only this way and then this way, okay? That's all he needs to do, fairly boring. Does it have anything to do with karate? He thinks nothing. Second thing he needs to do, paint the fence, but moving like this, okay? And then with his left hand, and then right hand. It's beautiful, white fence, I still remember it. Does it have anything to do with uh, karate? He thinks it has nothing to do with karate. So what does karate kid do? He gets bored. He goes, I don't need this. I want to do karate. I need my skills. I want to kill someone. No, he doesn't have that attitude yet. But he goes and finds another coach. This other guy is young, has a beautiful upper body just like me. Thank you. <laughs> and he has the best karate kicks and hits and everything. So he, he uh, leaves the old man and goes to this new trainer. And sure enough, he starts to learn the best kicks. Uh, kicks. Okay? He's improving his skills. And then a scene comes in the movie where a karate kid and his girlfriend, they go to a party and they get into a conflict. And suddenly, he loses his mind, he loses his temper, gets into a fight, and as far as I remember, he knocks down the other guy. I'm not sure about who knocks out who, but there is a fight. That's the point. And then they leave. And that's why it's good to have a girlfriend. The girlfriend confronts him about his attitude. What he has not noticed is that not only he learned new skills, but he became like that other coach. And if you know the movie, that other coach has pretty bad attitudes. He not only what became like him in his skills, but he became like him in his heart. It's a great picture. So when he realizes that had he became bad, which he didn't want to become, he goes back to the old man and he realizes that while painting he learned the best karate moves like that and he can protect and th these are the I think the basic defensive moves. I'm, I don't have any martial arts in my blood but I'm just making it up. So he learned it but while doing it he learned something else. He also became like the old man in his attitudes, in his attitudes. I think that's a great image of what this passage talks about. A disciple is not, about, not above his teacher, but everyone, when he's fully trained, will be like his teacher. Now, in this passage, I found the biggest obstacle, one of the biggest obstacles when it comes to discipling others. What it is, what does it mean to be above your teacher? I mean, really. It really means that I'm above Jesus? Is that what it means? This is what it suggests. What does it mean when a student, a follower, a disciple becomes above the teacher? Let me tell you what I think it is. At least I've found these sentences in my brain. When following means that I'm using Jesus to make me better. When I'm using Jesus to make me complete. When I'm using Jesus to make me a cool student whom others will say, wow, you are cool. What is in you? What is your secret? What is in me? What is my secret? That is when I'm more important than the master. It sounds kind of harsh, but are we using Jesus to heal me? to make me complete? Am I using Jesus? One thing, I love worship songs. I love Phil Wickham and all the others. And I'm bold to say this because all the songs I really enjoy at this conference. And I love Benny. I wholeheartedly follow the Hungarian student worship band wherever they lead me. Well, they lead me to the presence of God, as you heard tonight. But there are certain songs, I'll be honest, Jesus, you came for me. 
Jesus, you heal me. He just, Jesus, you give me. And when that's all I hear in the song, I go, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yes, it's true. But he healed me so that he would be expressed through me. It's not my healing that's important. It's him. Because in the healing, I'm becoming like him. And I'm showing you him. When the discipleship, when my following is all about me, it's not following. It means the student is above the master. When it's all about him, when I'm following him and after a while you see Jesus in me, I'm really following him. That is the third connection. Let me read it to you. The third connection, when you follow like it is all about him, people will want to follow you. When you follow him and it's all about you, people will leave you eventually. When you follow him like it's all about him and you want to be like him and you want to express him and you want to know him and you want to make him shown, people will come and they will ask you, who is he? They won't ask you, who are you? Maybe first, but then they will ask you, who is he you're following? Wow, he's making a difference. But if all they ask, wow, you are a cool Christian. You dress right and everything is cool because you have a good wife who picks the good colors. I loved purple when I was a student. Wow, I don't know what people thought about me. <laughs> who cares? Who cares how we dress as long as they see Jesus and as long as they want my Jesus? Then I'm a follower. Then I'm a follower. Now, the fourth connection is for, from 1 Thessalonians 1, 5 to 7. And then I will summarize all four. I know four uh, can be a lot uh, after 8 o'clock. But 1 Thessalonians 1, 5 to 7. You know what kind of man we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. How do we learn? Discipleship is all about learning. Mathetes, that's the Greek word for disciple. It's all about learning. It means a student. It means a learner. Now, how do we learn? We learn by information. We learn by instruction. We learn by teaching. All that must be there. But learning doesn't stop there. We learn by example. We need an example that we can copy. We need an example that we can imitate. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.5 You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. It wasn't only information that Paul imparted. He lived among them so that they can see him, so that they can copy him. Now, here's a story because it's late. When I was in college, I studied leadership. I read all the books, I went to all the classes, and I took all the tests. Did I learn leadership? Part of it, yes. The day came when we had to do a case study. The, uh, the, the task was, the project was, we had to go to a company, there were certain companies picked, and we had to approach the secretary and set up a day with the CEO. Just spend a day with the leader. So we went there, at, I set it up, I went there at 9 o'clock, and I was a shadow. I followed this person all day long to all the meetings, to his office. I saw him make phone calls. I saw him make decisions. I saw him having a schedule. <laughs> I was a student. Wow. All what I learned in the book came alive. And when that happened, learning happened. How do I teach my children uh, to love God? Well, every night I read the Bible. Every night we read the Bible. But then I'm trying, I realize they'll watch me and they'll follow what I do. So I'm trying to use life lessons, situations. Last week, uh, there's a business we are buying a service from. 
And there was this one person who sold us certain things for our home. It doesn't matter. I paid him, and I got a receipt every time I paid. Two weeks ago, this person, and later I learned his boss showed up at our door, and they started to ask me questions. It was like an investigation. I felt really uncomfortable. It turned out that this guy I gave the money to, he kept it and never gave it to his business owner, to the boss. So a week later, the boss comes back, and for one hour, the kids are upstairs, and he was at the weekly meeting, and I'm talking to this guy, and I'm giving him all the papers, everything, to give him evidence. So uh, I didn't have to pay any extra, but he calculated how much it was so that that person who messed up could pay. Could pay. And I went up that night, and the kids were like, who was he? What happened? This is illegal. Cool. This is crime. <laughs> Daddy, give me the story. And I'm like, OK, but here's the story, and I need to read the Bible. Here's the story. I need to read the Bible. If I do this story thing, they're going to take my 30 minutes. I want to have time for the Bible. And I go, oh, my, this is perfect. We have read the Bible. And in the Bible, it says sin will have consequences. And someone needs to pay the consequences of sin. So I used the story to tell them this person fell in sin. Sin has consequences that he will have to pay. They were like wide-eyed. And then I said, remember we read this in the Bible? This is what's happening. This is what's happening. And then, instead of just leaving there with punishment and payment, it was a perfect situation to explain the gospel, grace, and why Jesus died. You see, this is how learning happens. You receive because you emptied yourself. You receive life that changes you. Once that happens, you can pass it on. But not only in words, but through life situations as well. When I learned this, I, I'm trying to change my discipleship, and I'm sharing this with you so you can pick it up and take it into your context. This is the last story for tonight. Uh, two of the guys singing here, one is Benny here, and the other one is Mate in the back. They have another brother. His name is Chris, and I discipled Chris for four years. I love that guy dearly. Now he goes to our church. He starts to do uh, church planting. I'm like, every Sunday is, is that joy that Bill just described. I'm seeing him live his, his Christian life. But anyway, we sat down every week, read the Bible, drank coffee. That was my discipleship. And I was like, there's something missing here. So during the semester, I told Chris, I'm going to Transylvania on a trip, on a mission trip, helping our Transylvanian ministry. Come and join me. Come and join me. Come for two days. Let's get out. He came, just the two of us. The others were already there. We had six hours going to Transylvania. We had six hours coming back from Transylvania. We talked about girls. And we talked about life career decisions for 12 hours. Awesome conversation. We got there. He saw me wake up in the morning. He saw me read my Bible. I saw him read his Bible. It wasn't in a cafe talking about quiet time. It was doing it together. Beautiful. Encouraging each other. He saw me going out sharing my faith, I saw him going out share his faith. He saw me eat, and I eat beautifully. <laughs> and it shows. I saw him eat. It doesn't matter. Oh, yes, it matters. Because for two days, we shared life. It wasn't just knowledge. Three examples of what discipleship is. You receive life because you have nothing in you to offer. In order to receive, you must empty yourself of yourself. You have to make that 
Tariq who talked about faith step of dying to self so that you can receive. Once you have life in you, you have a lot to offer. How do you offer it? Just showing Jesus in you. Not only in words, but in your life. That is a full circle, at least to me. Now, a few encouraging words. How do I store up capacity for discipleship? Okay? Let me read you five passages that anytime I read this, I'm just, I want more life. Here it is. John 14. Jesus is the life. Jesus is the life. Hebrews 4.12. His word is alive. Romans 8.2. The spirit of life. And then we read in John 6 that the spirit of life gives life. And then John 7, he is the living water. Don't just read your Bible. When you sit down for a quiet time, life comes. Don't just be filled with the spirit check because you learned it how to. You receive the spirit of life. And once that happens in the morning, you are ready to make disciples. Believe me. Because there is the life in you that you need to pass on. Four connections. The first one, in order to give, you must first receive. It is that simple. Just like basketball. So the disciple others does not take long years to learn. This is number two. It takes a faith step to die to self. Once that happens... You will receive. Once you receive, you can give. Connection number three. When you follow like it is all about him and it's not about you, students will want to follow you. Believe me. Because they want to know Jesus. He is exciting. He is life. Once they see him, they go, I want him. It's him. Who made me be a Christian. That is why I'm still a Christian. I met him. Five kilometers from here. I still remember. Seeing Jesus. In Jay Clyde. I still love Jay. But I don't need Jay anymore. I don't need Jay anymore. I'm still in love with the Jesus I saw. On the beach. Quite a few years ago. Connection number four. Life is best imparted, and life with capital L. Life is best imparted in life situations so that others can see, imitate, and truly learn. I have two and a half minutes. One last question. This is extra, free. I don't need any coffee to give this to you. But I have one important question I ask myself all the time as responsible for the Hungarian ministry. When students leave our movement, why are there some students who stop following Jesus? When students leave our movement and we put our life into them, why are there some students who stop following Jesus? It's an important question. I'm all about raising up leaders for the future, not for the three years there in the campus ministry. Why? There are thousands of reasons. Read the Bible. Well, one of them might be this. One of them might be this. One of them might be that they followed a human. One of them, it might be that they followed a human. And when they left the movement, that human was not there anymore. So they had not, no one to follow. What I see is that those students who keep following Jesus are those, and I'm just repeating myself, whom in discipleship saw in their disciple, their discipler, Jesus. And once they leave the movement, Jesus will be with them every day until the end of the age. There is uh, someone singing here, and uh, he's Andrish. He also has a brother. And now, I haven't really discipled everybody's brothers and sisters. <laughs> but David, I did with Chris. They were in the same group <clears throat> with Chaba. And 
Balash and some others. There's actually one guy who is not following Jesus out of that group. Anyway, thousands of reasons. But David left our movement on good terms. I mean, he graduated finally. <laughs> and he is also now graduating soon from the Baptist seminary. It's not because he, I'm sorry, it's not because he was not smart. He was just not studying something that really interested him, okay? Just to give you the full picture. He might be watching it, no. <laughs> he really is a smart guy and it shows in his seminary work. Anyway, he left our movement. He's now gone. He doesn't come to the weekly meeting. We meet him, we meet once a semester when we have time. But last semester in the fall, I went to uh, visit him in his school. He became a school teacher in a school that the Baptist Church took over. He is the appointed uh, school pastor. It's a cool job. So I went to see what he does. I walk into the classroom, all these crazy students are sitting there, and you know what he does? He's drawing the second point of the gospel on the board for these non-believer students. These students are falling apart but some of them really following him. Now, I was so pleased because he's doing something that's way out of Campus Crusade. I'm not there. The movement is not around him. But you know what? Jesus is. Because in our movement, he began to follow Jesus, not Lotsi Baczynski, not a human. Somehow, by the grace of God, he saw in our movement Christ who is life, and he started to follow him, and he follows him up until this day. If I wish you something tonight, is that you would see that happen through you. But it starts with being a disciple. Experience life, and then you will have a lot very soon to give to others. Let me pray, and then you can uh, spend some time discussing. I'll give you one question. Dear Jesus, it's just uh, so embarrassing when I don't follow you. It's just um, any minute that I think uh, I know and I have enough on my own is just a wasted minute. Only you are life. So we come to you for life. We want to empty ourselves, as Tariq could share this morning. We want to leave it all. We want to give it away all. We want to make that faith step. We want to empty ourselves so that we can receive you and you can take completely con control of our lives so that your life would be in us. And then we just want to turn around and go and share you with others. Because if they will see you, they will want to follow you. Because you are beautiful. You are worth following. You are worth knowing. You are a worthy teacher. You are the master. You are life. And we could continue all night long talking about you. We love you. You are the master. We're following you. Amen. Amen. Let me ask you one thing. For uh, I think we have four minutes. Four minutes to reflection. Um, you heard four connections. One is... You need to receive in order to give. I don't need to repeat it. I already did. I'm just taking up time. Out of the four, which one you want to take and further study? Out of the four, which one you want to take and study further? I think if you make that decision now in these four minutes, that can become a study in the next week. And then I'll be really happy. Because it's not about this hour. It's about the time when you go back. So out of the four, if you could write it down, what is the one that through that point you heard God speak to you, that you really started to think about it, you want to take it further, you want to study it in, in that passage or the other passages. Is that clear? Just make one little note. I want to follow up on this one. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, can you wait, please? <laughs>
We want to thank uh, Lati for his talk, for his passion, for Jesus, for Christ, for his deep, um, just um, for his deep talk and for the care about the Hungarian ministry. And I want to uh, give him just a little gift, just to thank you for just being here, being with us, and leading us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Whoa. It's a beautiful cross. Excellent. Fits the talk perfectly. Follow him. Thank you. <laughs>